ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد we begin by praising allah we praise him and we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness and we take refuge with Allah from the evil of our souls and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, no one can misguide. And whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves astray, no one can guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is indeed his servant and his messenger. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we are going to be talking about two other major sins, and that is abandoning fasting the month of Ramadan and abandoning Hajj. Now, we have already talked about as salah and as zakah, and we've talked, of course, about shirk and the many different aspects of shirk and how we should avoid all of those things. And all of these things, my dear brothers and sisters, encompass the five pillars of Islam. As we know, the Prophet ﷺ said that Islam is built upon five things. And these five have been known as and have come to be called the five pillars of Islam. And I want us to think about this concept of the five pillars. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ described the religion of Allah as like a beautiful building. And he said, and the Prophet ﷺ said, the people go round this building admiring it. But they notice that there is one brick missing. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I am like that brick, I am like that missing brick. The coming of the Prophet ﷺ has come to complete the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is another example of the religion of Islam has been compared to a building. So let us imagine a building supported by five pillars. The pillars are, of course, the mainstay of the building. They are the things that hold that building up. But of course, a building is composed of much more than just pillars. A building is composed of a roof and of walls and of windows and rooms and furniture and so many different things. So it's important to understand that the five pillars of Islam is not the entirety of Islam. The five pillars are the things that support and hold up the religion. So they support it, they hold it up. And if you were to take away one of those pillars, then the whole of the building, the whole of the edifice would collapse and would crumble. So upholding the pillars of Islam is essential. If we take away one of those pillars, then surely we will see the destruction of Islam, either in our own personal lives or indeed as the body, the ummah. If we find that we abandon these pillars of Islam, we will find that we will disintegrate, we will dissolve, we will no longer have any coherence as a nation. So these are the things that hold us together. And that is why, without doubt, amongst the greatest of the major sins is abandoning any one of the five pillars of Islam. And I mention this because there are not that many hadith there are not that many verses of the Qur'an that really directly show us that not fasting Ramadan or not making Hajj has a particular very severe torment, not like, for example, abandoning a Salah or abandoning the Zakah, which we had some very, very clear verses of the Qur'an and very, very poignant sayings of the Prophet wasallam about that. But Abandoning fasting the month of Ramadan and abandoning Hajj is much more understood to be uh, amongst the greatest of the major sins because they constitute the pillars of Islam. They are two of the pillars of Islam. 
and therefore abandoning them is equivalent to abandoning Islam. Uh, and Abdullah ibn Abbas, he mentioned this, that Islam and the principles of the religion are tied together by three things. So he mentions three things, although there are, of course, five pillars of Islam, but he is mentioning three things that Islam and its principles uh, are tied together by. And he said, witnessing that there is no deity except Allah, the prayer and fasting during Ramadan. If anyone abandons any of these, he becomes an unbeliever, and we seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that. So there is some opinion that the person who abandons fasting Ramadan altogether actually abandons the religion of Islam. And we will see that that is a similar type of case with the Hajj. Many companions seem to have considered that anyone who abandoned one of the five pillars of Islam, it was as if they had abandoned Islam altogether. Of course, abandoning a salah and abandoning zakah are the most serious of the two, but that does not mean that abandoning Ramadan or Hajj is also serious as we will find out. And we mention again something we have mentioned before, that we can understand the seriousness of a sin by looking at its opposite. So when we look at the issue of zakah, it is only enough for us really to reflect upon how important being charitable is. Being charitable is so important. It's such an essential virtue for every individual human being to inculcate within themselves. But it's also essential on a collective level that in order to be able to live together as human beings successfully and happily in communities and families and as a whole, we need the spirit of charity and it is absolutely essential for us to encourage it, to inculcate it uh, and to live according to it. And that is of course why we mentioned the system of zakah, the act of worship of zakah has been instituted. Uh, because that virtue of charity is so important. So how about fasting? What is the virtue? Uh, why is leaving fasting so bad? What is the virtue that fasting is aiming to inculcate? Well, we get a clue from that when we look at the Qur'an and we see uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is the second surah, 183rd to 184th ayah, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا قُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Which means, O oh, you who believe, fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those who came before you لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That you may acquire piety, taqwa, the fear of Allah, the mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining to us the wisdom behind fasting. First of all, that fasting is prescribed, it is an order, it is something we have to do. It is not uh, something that is voluntary. You have to fast unless, of course, you have a genuine excuse that has been explained to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, either in the Qur'an or through his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So there are people who are excused from fasting, like for example someone who is very old and fasting will affect them negatively, or someone who has a type of terminal illness which means that uh, fasting could harm their health and they may need to constantly be taking medicine. So these people do not have to fast, uh, nor does a person who is traveling nor does a person who is ill, although the traveler and the person who is temporarily ill, of course, they have to make their fast up at a later time, as do uh, women who are breastfeeding or who are pregnant. Well, all of them, they are all excused from fasting. And women who are in their time of the month also, they are excused from fasting, but they have to, all of them, make that fast up. Uh, although there is a difference of opinion about women who are breastfeeding, and who are pregnant, they can actually pay the compensation for that. So there's a difference of opinion. But the point being 
is that those are the exceptions. Otherwise, everybody who is resident has to fast, and that is compulsory, and there is no excuse otherwise not to fast. Fasting is very, very important because, number one, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ It is the way through which and by which you are going, it is going to help you acquire taqwa. Taqwa is this essential ingredient. It is a characteristic, it is a virtue, it is a part of our mental makeup that is vital for the believer. Without taqwa, you are not really going to be able to live your life as a Muslim. So it is a type of characteristic that we need. So what is taqwa? Let's just take a little bit of time to explore this and to understand this. Taqwa, although it's translated as the fear of Allah or the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thursdays provide. Taqwa, as we mentioned before, comes from the Arabic word shield. So taqwa is that which is a shield between you and the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is that which causes you to abandon the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited. And that's essentially it. And we've mentioned this before, okay? That taqwa is essentially a quality that keeps you away from Allah's punishment and that keeps you away from doing the haram things and ensures that you do those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered you to do. So how does fasting help to develop within you taqwa? Well, it's because fasting is an act of self-discipline. And at the very beginning of this series, we talked about life being a test. We explained how life was a test, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made life a test, and that what do we have? We have our desires, we have a shaitan, and those things are trying to lead us away, or they have the inclination or the means to lead us away from the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the other hand, we have our fitra, and we have our aql, our intelligence, and we have the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to follow and for us to go on the straight path. So it is this fasting that really enhances those positive qualities those things that help us to keep away from following our desires and from following shaitan. Number one, because in Ramadan, of course, the shaitan is actually chained. And this is so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us through his mercy, through his favor, to taste how the life is without shaitan constantly interfering and bothering us and so on and so forth. So in the Ramadan, the shaitan is chained. So this is, means the shaitan is kept away from us. Some scholars explained, it doesn't mean shaitan does not bother you at all, it just means that his effect on you is a lot less. But just as important, if not more important than that, fasting teaches us to control our appetites. It teaches us to control our desires. If we can abstain from eating and drinking and from sexual intercourse and from smoking, from dawn until sunset. And also, of course, fasting is not only about keeping away from food and drink and from intimate relations. Fasting is also keeping away from evil in your speech and your action. As we know, the Prophet wasallam he said that Allah has no need of a person to abstain from food and drink who does not abstain from evil in their speech and action? So keeping away from evil speech and evil action is so important. And that is a part of fasting in reality. So now, if we can manage to restrain our appetites, what does it teach us? It teaches us that we do have the ability to control our desires. We do have the ability to overcome those essential needs, those essential desires, we can abstain, we can withhold, we can control ourselves. And that is the basic lesson of fasting. It's self-discipline. Self-discipline, which is essential. How will we ever obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How will we ever 
inculcate within ourselves and do those good deeds and keep away from those sins that are going to lead us to destruction in this life and the next if we do not learn how control our appetites and to control our nafs to control al hawa to control our desires so this is amongst the great great benefits of fasting the month of ramadan so when you don't do that you lose tremendously you are eroding a very very important pillar of islam you have taken away from your life that important thing that teaches you and inculcates within you and educates you to have the taqwa of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is why my dear brothers and sisters you can see why abandoning the fast of ramadan is such a serious thing why abandoning it is really the equivalent of abandoning islam because at the heart of it is this jihad the jihad bil nafs the jihad against yourself so when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked what is the best jihad the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the best jihad is the jihad against your nafs the jihad against yourself for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked and what is the best hijra mean the best emigration and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the best hijra is leaving the sins for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so i hope my dear brothers and sisters this is partly uh, will help you to understand uh, why leaving fasting the month of ramadan is a major sin amongst the major sins and we could put this above many 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 other sins that we will be talking about in the future but this sin of abandoning one of the pillars of islam is far greater than many of those other sins so be very very careful do not take this matter lightly at all let us also look at the issue of hajj my brothers and sisters hajj is also very very important and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any doubt has uh, ordered the hajj upon us in surah ali imran which is the third surah in the 97th ayah and pilgrimage to the house is an obligation upon the people towards allah for anyone who is able to find a way to do it so therefore without doubt making hajj to the house making the pilgrimage to mecca which as we know is only at a certain time of the year during a certain date so it is a very specific time as you can only make hajj or pilgrimage to mecca in the month of dhul hijjah during the prescribed days which is during the first 10 days okay so this is the time for the hajj and each day has its particular rites and rituals and things that should be done so umar ibn al khattab he said i had a mind to send messengers to various cities to see who had the capability of performing hajj but did not do it and then to impose jizya on them since such people are not amongst the muslims so it shows that umar considered the people who did not make hajj it is interesting that he did not seem to consider that the people uh, who made hajj he considered he wanted to impose jizya on them and he felt that people who did not make hajj when they had the money and they had the wealth and they had the ability to do it and they had not done it they are not amongst the muslims it shows my brothers and sisters that if you have the money to make hajj and that money is in your possession then you are obliged to make that hajj of course as long as physically you know you are fit enough and you you know you're not under the threat of you know uh, some severe illness by traveling of course if you don't have the physical capacity or the financial capacity then making hajj is not an obligation upon you but if you do then you have to make hajj and uh, and from this saying of umar ibn al khattab there is the suggestion that your failure to make hajj when you can afford it is almost or if perhaps it is that you are not truly a muslim at all this making hajj is one of the pillars of islam so my dear brothers and sisters if you have the money to make hajj you must make hajj you do not wait 
and say, oh, I will wait until I am older. I will wait until I have reached an older age. And then I will make the Hajj. No, this is very, very wrong. As many people think like that. Oh, I'm going to wait till I get an old man, then I will change my life, and then I will repent, and I will make the Hajj. SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters, what guarantee do you have that you are going to live until you are older? What guarantee do you have that you are going to make that time when you reach that age that you will be able to make Hajj? No. If you have the means and you have the ability to do it, you must do it now. So Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he said, a person who has enough means to be able to make the Hajj to Allah's house but does not perform Hajj or who meets the requirements for paying zakah but he does not pay it will be asked at the time of death to be returned to this life. And we mentioned that narration previously concerning the zakah. So basically uh, to recap on that narration, someone questioned him and said, how can you say that is the case? And then he quoted the verse of the Qur'an that actually says that if you give me time, I will act charitably. And he understood the acting charitably, meaning to pay the zakah and to make the hajj. My brothers and sisters, again, we want to emphasize the importance of hajj. It is important from the point of view of the unity of the Muslims. At the heart of this hajj, it is a beautiful act of worship that combines many, many different things. It combines hardship, charity, sacrifice, prayer, visiting a truly important place where we remember a person, Ibrahim alayhi salam, who of course built the Kaaba, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who was born in Mecca. We make various rites and rituals like Sa'i going between Safa and Marwa. We assemble on the plain of Arafah, which reminds us of the Day of Judgment. We storm the Jamrat, which reminds us of Shaitan and his attempt to misguide us from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of these things have tremendous spiritual benefits. And on top of that, we all meet as Muslims, all dressed in the same dress, the same white clothing. No difference between us, rich man, poor man, you know, beautiful, whatever we, however you are, your outward appearance is not important because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking to your hearts. And that's what Hajj, one of the beautiful things that Hajj teaches us is that our outward appearance is not what is important. It's our hearts, it's our love of Allah, our worshipping Allah. And it makes us understand that we are one ummah, different colors, different tribes, different languages, all of them meeting there in this place to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is a huge benefit, brothers and sisters, that Hajj will inculcate into you. And what a tremendous crime to miss that opportunity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and help us to be of those people who worship him in the best manner. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.